Welcome to Penn State Dickinson Law's Profiles in Leadership Series. My name is Daryl Lim. I serve as H. Lady Montag Junior Chair and Associate Dean for Research and Innovation at the Law School. This series offers an unparalleled opportunity to glean insights from top leaders who serve in government, education, the private sector, and civil society. In each episode, we invite these leaders to reflect on their journeys and share skills, core values, and qualities that make them the leaders they are today. I'm very pleased to welcome two guests in this episode. First, we have Joe Myers, who is a filmmaker and partner in Story Shop. Previous to that, he served as creative director at Penn State Public Broadcasting. He has directed nationally broadcast documentaries. His work has been seen on PBS, Discovery Networks, among others. His honors include Mid Atlantic Chapter, National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Emmy Awards, the Silver Screen Award, the Sydney Golden Eagle, and a prominent festival awards, including Bare Bones and Action on Film. Joe is also an experienced designer and inventor. Uh, next, I have Gary Gilden, who joined Dickinson Law's faculty after graduating from Stanford Law School and spending three years as a civil litigator in Chicago. He served as Dean of the Law School from 2013 to 2019. Over his career, Gary has taught a variety of courses, including trial advocacy, civil liberties litigation, legal argument, and factual persuasion. He regularly teaches in international, national, and statewide continuing legal education programs that enhance the trial skills of practicing attorneys and has given more than 60 lectures on a variety of legal topics at universities, industry association events, and conferences around the country. He is a recipient of several awards and honors, including the Roscoe Pound Foundation's Jacobson Award for Excellence in the Teaching uh, in the teaching, the art and skill of trial advocacy. And that's certainly going to be one of our key points of focus today. So welcome to the both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, please uh, introduce yourselves and sort of tell us um, how the both of you met. Uh, I'm, I'm a filmmaker, documentary filmmaker by trade. I worked for quite a while at uh, Pennsylvania State University, including uh, as a uh, producer director and a creative director at uh, Penn State Public Broadcasting. And it was uh, during that time uh, that uh, I think the both of us had an opportunity to work on uh, a project called World on Trial, dealt with uh, human rights. And uh, we ended up in the same room around a table and um, I think we saw eye to eye on a lot of uh, the principles behind storytelling and maybe coming from different perspectives, but um, I, I think we got to a place where we, we got along well and, and realized there was a lot we could learn from one another and, and took it from there. But I'd only modestly dis dissent. It's true that the meeting was in 2010 or 2011 and rolled on trial. I would have to say at, at that time, the. The word story was not in my trial advocacy vocabulary. So I think we were both talking about doing the same thing. I was talking about this pro this project was designed to essentially create a simulated trial of an international human rights uh, issue for the general public. So you know, I was there trying to lend it its trial authenticity. Joe was there trying to lend it its you know, ability of lay viewers to understand to be persuaded. And as we were approaching from those opposite extremes, suddenly there was just this constant crossover, but not because I had any view that I was doing anything with story. So well, you may not have you may not have used the word story. Correct. But I think that we had a meeting of the minds on on many subjects that um that let let me know at least that you were you were thinking along the same lines um and 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 in fact you often became a very good check on my tendency uh to sort of go off and flight creative flights of fancy and and get lost in the weeds so i think the, the there was a, there was a creative tension there that was really useful to me spot on it was like this fusion from two separate disciplines that suddenly the commonalities started just like perking out so, in ways that I wouldn't have anticipated. So what happened after that? Now, I had to do some research because of how much had happened. So 
we had these, we were doing a lot of sitting around while this film was taking as well as just kept talking. And I just had the sense that I got to find out what this guy's talking about because he's got something here that is really important, but I don't really know what it is yet. And uh, we just kept talking, talking, talking. And, he, you know, he's from the he's from the creative side. I'm from the absurdly rational side. And so it was a lot of conversation to try to find some point in the middle where uh, I adopted the creative tenets that drove it. And he was able to explain it in a more systematic way. And so in March of 2013, maybe two years later, we did this day-long program called Finding the Trial Story. That was sort of the first reveal of how we would try to, and by then I also started trying to figure out the brain science part of why this worked as well. So it was this confluence of story from the filmmaking perspective, law, and now why is neuroscience the tie that explains it. So we had this day-long CLE program where the first was an hour introduction to how the brain actually makes decisions versus how the legal system presumes it does. And then each element, Joe introduced the element of story, and then we applied it to a uniform fact situation. So where the arc of the day, the participants were starting to apply this and, and finding the trial story. And that was the first iteration. And we, we've done this, that program since then over 15 times in statewide programs for criminal defense lawyers in Minnesota, toxic tort seminars, women in the law seminars, because it, it applies in every single area. So before we started doing it in the course, we started again, I thought it was a pretty fantastic, uh, interesting program for training lawyers on this. Yeah, it's such a novel and interesting thing when I, when I first heard it. Joey, it looked like you're about to say something. Please go. Ahead. I was just going to disagree about something very, just, just, just tiny. That, that, that first day long program and, I would say a few of the subsequent programs, um, from my perspective, were 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 fascinating, but maybe not what they could be. And a lot of that comes down to me. <laughs> I, I I brought my sort of my filmmaking background to the table and spent a lot of time trying to take a room of people, a room of lawyers, and turn them into filmmakers in six and a half hours. Uh, with a full, you know, media studies education and film history. And um, I think it, what was most fascinating to me is the feedback that I, the very kind feedback I, I got from, from Gary over, over time in, in, in the task, and I preach this task all the time, but I had to do it for myself, which is the task of removing all of the things that are unnecessary uh, to making the points that that were most important. And I would say that when we when we give the presentation today, there's maybe a quarter, twenty five percent as much content, maybe less. But it's so very well tailored and it, it, you know so specific to what we're trying to teach that it works that much better and uh so what that, is it that it's you're a skill that i've teach. taken throughout my life really it's been uh that, that's actually a great segue to my next question oh. what is it you're trying to teach boil it down to the essence for us and unpack it well from my perspective it it's it's bringing some of the fundamental tenets of telling a good story uh to the legal profession to persuasion and when i talk about telling a good story it's not technique for telling a story it's not the way to sound, the way to act, the way to present yourself. Though those things are important, that's really entirely separate from what we're talking about. This is this is looking at how are people really persuaded and coming at it from both this artistic filmmaking, you know, long history, oral tradition, novel writing, all of that kind of kind of kind of background, and both the neuroscience background, which Professor Gilden has done over the last 10 years, a tremendous amount of reading and, uh, and, and research into. So I think when we, we bring those together, we look at how do people really make decisions and what are the key tenets we can teach the persuader to help the people make better decisions. Uh, and, that, and that many of those things come from filmmaking, but um, it's become 
really something of its own at this point, I would say, without getting into all the little specifics. I mean, I can, but. Right, so we're going to force them into the specifics, Daryl, but I'll just make <laughs> one comment, one comment for your listeners tune out because we'll eventually pivot to how everything Joe has been teaching uh, relative to telling the story to persuade jurors has uh, enormous ratifications for people in terms of developing their leadership style and skills, but I know we'll get to that in part two, but I didn't want people to turn off saying, wait, I didn't come here for trial advocacy training, but you know, when he talks about not techniques, the tenets of story, you know, I, I thought I was a pretty good teacher of trial advocacy, you know, the various techniques about organizing an opening statement, you know, direct exams by establishing rapport and conversation with a witness, cross-exam to control you know, how we do closing arguments. Uh, how we stack the facts, you know, well, Daryl, the you know, essence of law is the law sets out some sort of categorical requirements, and then you try to say, well, I've got the facts to establish each of these required elements, so I'm entitled to win. I'm the prosecutor. I proved, offered evidence of each of the elements of the crimes of the person's guilty. I'm the defense lawyer. I created reasonable doubt as to one element, so you must exonerate my client. It was very, we call it fact stacking. You know, how do we best stack the facts? And then how do we make the jury see those individual facts? And it turns out well, that's the way the legal system views how law works, but that's not at all how people process information and decide. So when Joe said, we're not talking about techniques, we're talking about the tenets of story. I've made a complete 180, which is perfect technique will get you nowhere if you've not come up with the factual story of what happened that the jury is going to recognize as most the most likely truth. And conversely, if you pick the right story and get that across, you know, you can be average on technique so long as the story gets across. And it's just a complete notion that, wait a minute, you know, this is, you know, you know lawyers, perfectionists, it was all about the technique. And then it's like, wait a minute, you know, we're looking at the wrong thing. So when Joe says tenets of story as the persuasion, it's because you're now you know, trials are, we wouldn't need trials if we had time machines. We would just go back in time, take the jurors to observe it, come back and report what they saw. But when, since we don't have the time machine, we have to bring the people from the past to the present. But those trolls trying to do the same thing. They're trying to put together what would I have seen if I was there. That's not about legal elements. That's not about stack facting, fact stacking. That's not about burden of proof. That's about how do humans behave given, and I'm going to force Joe to elaborate on this, given their uh, character traits or their backstory, which gives them certain motives. And they are inevitably going to act consistent with that character and motive. So, you know, when Joe talks about tenets of story, it's that when we bent back in that time machine, uh, I wasn't telling you about a bunch of facts to assemble under legal elements. I'm going to match what happened to the humans who were involved in the case. So I really would urge Joe to give just the capsule summary of what he calls tenets of story. He can sure. do it in a minute. I think the most important of all the tenants that we talk about uh, is this uh, notion of character and the idea that character, small things about somebody, about their performance of, of, of their life from the past um, are highly predictive of big things in the future. And that's sort of where we begin. It's understanding uh, that the way someone carries themselves throughout their life and the things they do. And these don't have to be, these are not, this is not about manipulation. These are not made up things. These are factual things that uh, you can glean from the description of a person. Um, that when your audience, in this case, your judge, your jury, begins to understand these attributes of the person, they very quickly, um, without even consciously deciding to do this, begin to sort of create an understanding of that kind of a person, that person that they now understand, and what types of actions that person would most likely take given a particular situation. And if you're able to establish that predictive nature of character very early, what happens is when someone is then presented, you know, later on with, did this happen or this happen? Well, that must have happened. This has to have happened. I know this person. I know what this person would have done. And that, on the one hand, might maybe seems a little scary. Uh, on the other hand, it opens up uh, that, that people make decisions this way. But um, again, it's, it's not about, you know, 
conning someone into seeing a per person in a particular way, but bringing up real factual uh, bases for someone's determination of character and, uh, and, and helping them to create this sort of um, non-intellectual uh, profile that will enable them to predict and, and not just predict, but want particular future outcomes. So that's still pretty general, but I think that's so, sketchy. Yeah. Joe, the, the line that haunted me for a long time, Joe would make the statement in these programs to the students that if the jury underst if the jury understands character and the motive, what actually happened will be not only predictable but inevitable. And that if there were fact gaps, they would fill them in, even though you didn't have witnesses. And if there are witnesses who said it happened differently, they would just ignore it because based upon the character and motive that it would be inevitable. And of course, the whole trial process is no, no, that's not what happens. We're gonna look at what happened and not about this backstory. And we're gonna, and it's like, well, the jurors aren't supposed to make up new information. The jurors aren't supposed to ignore it. They're supposed to weigh the facts and this notion that, you know, it's all about the character and motive. You, you almost don't even have to explain what happened. And it bothered me because it was so offensive to you know how the legal system views it. And then I just kept asking myself, why would this be? And that's how I started sort of veering off into this neuroscience and without getting too wonky about it. You know, I only know enough to be dangerous because I read the neuroscience for you know lay people literature, but our brain is a black box. It sits in a black box in our head. It's not a camera. It doesn't see, you know, the eyes don't send a photograph into this black box. It just has to interpret all these signals. And it has, as we've developed, we had to interpret them immediately because we wouldn't be here if we had to suss whether the sound we were hearing was a predator or a friend. So we developed this evolutionary basis to say, I've got to make immediate decisions inside this blind black box based upon a million inputs that are coming in. So the, what the brain had to do is to say, Know, what's the best match based on my life experience? You know, it's like if the brain's a Google search, I'm going, to do, I'm going to give you the two variables and the top hit is most likely what happened. Well, these experiences baked into the black box were not a library to be researched. It was the people, the events in our life attached to people with certain character traits and motives. So every event that our brain predicts through its database is not an event. It's an event that happened because of someone had a certain attribute with certain motives. So when we start telling the jury the story of someone with this character trait and this motive, just as it was predicting, was this a lion that I should run from or is this a benign sound? They're saying, oh yeah, you know, people with that character trait and motive always do this as a matter of pattern and therefore that's what happened here. So it's this inc you know, incredible I mean, alignment. We do, this, sorry, sorry. we do this in every was. other part of our lives. Right. We we understand a person and we feel very strongly about what they are capable of, what they're not capable of, what based on we know of their past, what what their motives must be for actions in the future. So why would the as as a non lawyer, as someone who does not practice in the courtroom, you know, it's probably an offensive question, but why would the courtroom be different? Uh, it would be different because we say it's different because as humans and because we spent, you know, we've spent hundreds, if not thousands of years developing this way to make it different, to make it something that's entirely about logic and devoid of uh, emotion. And really, uh, can we do that? Are we, is that even possible? Um, yeah. Those are sort of the, well, those are sort of the bigger questions, but uh, you know, we, I think to an extent we have, we avoid getting into that philosophical realm because I, I, it may not be helpful, you know, when we're teaching this, but uh, that's sort of where I come from. So lots of uh, questions from what you both just shared, which is really rich in content. So first of all, does it make a difference when you're speaking to a jury compared to when you're speaking to a judge? Does the story that you tell change? Answer, absolutely no. So, That's yeah, stronger than I've ever heard you say. You know, we, we, assume, we assume that the judges are the most uber rational actors in the system trained to be rational. The whole legitimacy of the system is based upon the judge will set aside their life experience, uh, look at the facts of this case, you know, the whole system of stare decisis, and decide this case consistent with what other judges have done with similar cases, 
the humans are just given categorical traits, plaintiffs, defendants. Uh, it's going to be this uber rational exercise. And we, we believe the judges will, you know, that's the, the myth that that's what they'll do. But the judges have the same brains. And by the way, this decisional process that Joe's describing is below the level of consciousness. It's not that the jurors are saying, well, I think I'll look back at my life experience. This is happening autonomously. It's happening constantly. I mean, the easiest access to this information. And a lot of the neuroscience right. backs it up. You know, the, the simpler, this, the real thing that got me into it even simpler was Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Now, here's a guy who's a cognitive psychologist who wins the Nobel Prize in economics. So why did he win the Nobel Prize in economics? Because the whole system of micro and macro economics was based upon everybody's a rational economic rational decision actors. maker. And let's, yeah. let's uh, do, yeah. you know, put we all make our rational things. choices that will benefit right. us the most. <laughs> like, then he did all these uh, studies and experiments, which is, wait a minute, people are not acting in rational self-interest. Uh, they're acting, as I say, the, the thinking fast is this autonomous, what he describes as system one, it's an artifice, it's you know, subconscious immediate prediction, which is a, a, we've been trained to do that evolutionary. And it also is very easy on the glucose supply. So like the brain occupies 2% of the weight and uses 20% of the energy supply. So for the brain to do every, all the higher executive functions, it's going to be very inefficient and draw from other things. So the way the brain actually works is if, if something fits a pattern, System two, which would draw upon the glucose supply and say, let me re-examine that and take a 360 view of that, is going to lie fallow because the problem's been solved intuitively. And judges are the same way. You know, they have the same, you know, same uh, need to balance the body's glucose supply because there's things other than making decisions to keep us well and alive. And below the radar, you know, I think when they hear the story, they're almost predisposed to find the law to fit the story. They don't know it. They think they're being objective. And there's been some interesting studies uh, about judicial decision making that says the judges are very good being analytical when they have no life experience or care about it. But if it relates to their life experience or they have a dog in the hunt, then they then they really are being much more instinctual. And by the way, interestingly enough, over time, judges become less analytical and more instinctual. And I find that happening to myself, which is to say, okay, <laughs> That's interesting about the law. Tell me, tell me about the people. And as soon as I hear the story of the people, it's like this has to be the answer. So normatively, I, is that it, a good thing sorry. or a bad thing that people become more instinctual, judges become more instinctual as to become more experienced? And perhaps the broader philosophical question, when you think about it, then you think about the trial process as a process to find the truth. What actually happened? Judge decides based on quote unquote, the truth. But if it's all about storytelling, then is it ultimately, is the truth ultimately about the person who tells the better story? I can take an outsider's answer on that, which is that to me, the question of whether that's good or bad, um, well, that's not something I'm qualified to answer, I don't think. I think for, if I were to re-ask the question, it would be, um, are we remiss in not recognizing that this is how it works and making that part of our persuasion and part of our understanding of how people make decisions, if not entirely how people make decisions? Because if we don't, then how can we um, claim to be doing our best job at persuasion, uh, which is in, in, in your profession uh, important and also in mine. So is it is it good or bad? I don't know. Maybe a purely rational. I, I, I don't know. We can have an argument about whether a purely rational world would be a better world. Um, but I start from the perspective that that is not an attainable world. <laughs> so that's, I'm glad you asked that question because I started with this is terrible. As I say, when he, when he was doing the line, they'll, they'll fill in gaps with evidence you never offered and they'll ignore the counter evidence. It's like, this is terrible. And this is manipulation and the better storyteller. That's where I began. Then I started thinking, is this really manipulation or the way I've, I've put it by stealing other lines? When we're telling the story, we're not trying to manipulate. We're trying to say, I will take you inside the, the skin of the people who were involved. I'll, I'll make you see their lived experience. 
not to manipulate you. I'm going to try to, to take it on the level of who these people are. And is it a better, a, does it get us the truth better when we're, we take the fact finder inside the real people? Or if we say, well, let's just intellectualize the facts we know and try to put them on a scale for a burden of proof and stack them. So I think there's a good argument to be made that this is a greater pathway to truth. We just need to then be asking the question, how do we modify the processes that don't essentially suggest we're going to do it a different way and, and we're not going to do it in this truth way? So the, the bigger question for me is, should we be modifying our trial process to say, if this is going to take you, you know, if this is going to be a more reliable time machine, because you're going to go back in time, not just by hearing a lawyer stack facts, by really getting to know these people as best we can. Maybe we need to adjust things like rules of evidence to say character evidence is radioactive. Just limit yourself to the moment of the whatsoever. So, yeah, it might have been a non-answer, but I, I'm not concerned that this no, is that's helpful, uh, this is a lawyer trick. I think the excess is no, we, should, we should, you know, we our legal so, system, our trial system hasn't changed since you know the Enlightenment, uh, and we didn't know anything about the brain. No one even did a, did a brain staining, I think, until the 1920s. So this was based upon this semi-platonic notion that there's, you know, the rational side of the brain that will fight against and defeat emotion and will be purely rational. The best decision will be rational. And we designed a system that suggested the brain that works that way. And if that's not how the brain works, and if, for example, we haven't veered into that, emotion is not only part of every decision, but important, maybe we need to say, why don't we just upgrade the system say, well, now let's see what we've learned and what is the better system for lawyers, judges, and jurors to account for that. I would agree. I mean, help, if, help, if, help our, yeah. our listeners to ex understand this in context. Pick one or two of your favorite examples or case studies from the talks that you gave, the course, courses that you teach, and, and help us to understand how this actually applies. I, I will steal this from Joe because he, he, won't, he won't say it. He won't be. So you have a room full of lawyers, right? And by the way, these people are so skeptical when this program begins, right? So a room full of lawyers who, <laughs> believe, <laughs> who believe, because we've all been socialized on that, that you know, I'm going to remain open-minded, a juror's going to remain open-minded, simply warehouse information as it's produced until the end of the case when they start deliberating. And so the first segment of the story program is about character. And he begins by showing a clip from Lethal Weapon, where nothing happens. An old movie by now, but... Old movie. It's just Mel Gibson is standing in his trailer doing nothing. And then he asks the people in the room, you know, tell me about him. And we have to cut off discussion after 20 minutes because they have all these things about what they've learned and what's going to happen. Then he shows another film clip, the first sequence of Rocky One, where Rocky's just walking down the street. And then we stop the film. He says, tell me about this. And they have all these ideas of who this guy is, what he's going to do. And this is a room full of lawyers where the answer should be, I'm sorry, I've not heard all the evidence yet. I can't answer any of these questions until I've seen all the evidence. And, and again, I mean, these specifically are the scenes to give you a little, where that I consider nothing happened scene. Nothing in each of these scenes, about a minute, minute and a half long, happens that at all relates to the what we think of as the plot content of the film. We learn nothing about Rocky as a boxer in this scene. We never learn nothing about Mel Gibson as a police officer. We don't even know he's a police officer in that scene. Why is the scene there? So to me, that was the empirical proof because no one ever said, excuse me, I can't answer any of these questions because I've not heard all of the evidence yet. Uh, because their brain was proof that their brains have been grooved to predict, you know, they never met Mel Gibson before. They never met his screen character. They never met, you know, Rocky screen character. But based on their life experiences, they were unhesitant about volunteering all these things about who this person was, and how he's likely to behave. Whether he may or may not be unstable, uh, his his marital status and how that affects his his motivation going through life. I mean, people get into very kind of deep philosophical uh, predictive postures after watching these one minute nothing. long scenes where, where nothing, nothing where nothing happens. <laughs> There's also been some empirical work on judges where they actually, you know, not that the judges confessed that, but 
you know, they found that the decisions were really skewed based on precedence where it was something about life experience that was meaningful to the judge. Uh, and interestingly enough, found there were better decisions if you then had diverse judges on the panel. So but that's a different issue. It just simply was corroborative of the and of course, I think part of the critique. Well, of you're, the what you're, what you're, that's not a different issue when there were diverse judges, because because people also, there are differences to our our personal backstories coming in, and and yet there's a lot of commonality. Right, so. and I think the uh, the final bit of empirical proof. We take a look at today's Supreme Court, which maybe is just a more extreme version of other Supreme Courts. I bet each of those judges would pass a lie detector test. It would say, when I have a case, I come in with an open mind and objectively apply the precedence. I think sure. all nine, and nine of them would pass the test, but they all have life experiences that have led them to be predictive. And that prediction, I think, drives the analytical side. But you know, there, it's probably been true forever. It's just a more, probably mean more extreme in terms of the uniformity or the curating of all those life experiences or their willingness to be bold about overruling precedents instead of being more modest about their role. But I think these are high people of the high the legal profession all looking at the same past cases and past statutes. I mean, we always had concurring opinions, dissenting opinions. And was it an intellectual difference or was it a life experience difference? How, how do you think all of this applies in the leadership context? So see, the same seminar you that you get out a group of CEOs or people. Um, yeah, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna segue, I'm gonna lead on this because Joe said he didn't think he had anything to say about it, and then I'm gonna make sure. Well, I didn't say I didn't have anything to say about right. it. Right. So but I'm gonna use what you say as right. as information that I am then okay. gonna work on. Exactly. So I'm gonna <laughs> use some repetition and then offer something new that we haven't uh talked about yet as part of persuasion. So in my view, the elements of story are directly applicable to leaders. I mean, leaders certainly have to educate the people they're leading. They have to persuade them to follow. So I could say, well, listen, we're all rational creatures. Let me just show you the empirical information, the statistical information that suggests you should work this way. When's the last time I convince anyone of anything. Right. Or you could say, why don't I just try to tell you the the story of what I think our enterprise is, who we are, and what our mission is, who who I think we all are, and what we think is our purpose here. You know, there's this whole domain of purposeful leadership. You can't lead anybody unless they come to a common understanding of your purpose. To me, that's just character and uh, motive as opposed to let me try to to uh, logically persuade you empirically. Then if, if we go a little bit further here, we haven't yet talked about emotion. We just talked about the best way people figured out what happened. We've not yet talked about what role emotion does or does not and play. That's because we just don't say it, but I think it's right. implied. But no, in this, in this discussion, we haven't. So of course, from the legal perspective is it plays no role. In fact, reason suppresses that because we don't want emotional driven decisions. Uh, neuroscience will tell you emotion emotion is simply the signals that come from inside the body to the brain as opposed to external talking about what the body needs I, I need more oxygen i need more nutrition you know that causes uh, you know a reaction which we experience as emotion those are signals from inside the body by the way what's the body's most brain's most important job keep us alive and well so not only you know those decisions are going to, those inputs are going to drive the decision. So the notion that okay, well we'll sever emotion from decision making ignores the notion that there's this integration between what we'd call reason and emotion. So let's go back to story and let's go back to leadership. So you know, the story element I'll have Joe talk about in a moment, you know, is the stakes, uh, and therefore it's designed uh, to create the rooting interest for this outcome. And again, as a leader. Not only do you need to say, I'm not going to simply push facts on you. I'm going to give you who we think we are as a character and our mission. And I'm also going to try to identify what's at stake here. So now that you are emotionally invested in pursuing our goals. So the, the, the character, motive, stakes combination of story, to me, is an indispensable attribute of a leader who's trying to educate and persuade people to follow. But it's probably a good time, if you're willing, Darren, to let Joe talk about stakes because it's just a brilliant <laughs> I'm way. I'm just going to ask a quick follow-up question. Uh, the map together, 
the time that you were teaching this course, which was so great the time that you teach. So how that informed this so you're breaking up a little. Yeah, you're here. breaking up. I'm, uh, I'm not hearing you clearly. Let me repeat that. So, so all that between the time that you were teaching this course and the time that you served as dean, can you talk about how your time as dean was informed by what you learned in this course? Oh, yeah. So absolutely. You know, thank goodness for Joe and thank goodness I you know, came far enough along because, you know, we... It was a challenge. It was a challenging time for all all law schools. You know, after the two thousand eight recession, eventually people realized, wait a minute, you're going to spend three years and hundreds of thousands of dollars to be unemployed. So there was this absolute plummeting uh, in the admissions across the board. And at the same time, we were sort of rolling out a startup law school with a hundred eighty five year history. Uh, and the notion is, so how do you motivate all of your constituencies to you know, Come here as a student, support it financially as an, a donor, work, you know, do more work for no more money as a faculty member or staff. And it was, well, you know, first of all, you know, here's the story here. Here's our backstory. Here's our 190 year tradition of who we thought we are and our mission. Our purpose was, you know, produce lawyers who are going to change the lives of their clients. And as you know, Daryl, you kind of work every day. Sometimes you don't really understand what you're doing. It's not front and center. But you know, we actually had a consultant who came in who said my job was to be the uh, keeper of the culture and, to, and everything I said had to be about our purpose. And so it, every time it was how privileged and gifted we were to be producing these people who were going to go out and with this skill set change, change for the better the lives of the clients, whatever they did with it. And so that sort of makes you feel better about going to work if you understand what that mode of admission is. And of course, the stakes are where you're facing this. Like, you know, I think it was it was a gift in some ways to be facing an existential crisis because, you know, the reason we're doing this is we're going to preserve and save this wonderful hundred at that point, 80 to 85 year old institution that done all this stuff good. So, you know, the stakes are, you know, we get to defy all the critics and all the skeptics by saying, you know, let, let's show that, you know, who we are and how meaningful it is. And, you it was a rooting interest for people to say, not only do I feel good about the purpose and who I are, you know, I'm excited because I understand what's at stake here. So it was, again, the absolute, you know, that was really my North Star for everything I didn't say. But if you let Joe talk about stakes a little, because that, you know, it's, and by the way, I see that now every day in this is sort of, he was ahead of his time because everybody talks about stakes of the election, stakes of X, but he's got a great explanation of it. Maybe you can talk about going back sure. to the media, yeah. media thing, how you show stakes. Yeah, that, yeah. What yeah. I mean, <laughs> we're throwing stakes around a little bit here, um, but to just give a quick explanation, that's the idea that once you have the attributes of a character and that's some, that's, that's significantly predictive of their, um, future outcome or the outcome that they, they should have. Um, how can we go beyond that to really look at uh, why you should have an emotional investment uh, beyond understanding this character because of pattern matching with your own life experience and so on? Why should you have an additional emotional investment in a particular outcome? And uh, the answer to that is is the word stakes. It's this idea that there's always something to be gained or lost on an emotional, non-intellectual, uh, uh, on an emotional, non-intellectual level uh, when we're looking at the outcome of any particular situation, right? And, and how, how important is that? You say, well, you know, that's, that's, it's important, but it doesn't, it's not what, it's not what I use to make my decisions. And the examples I like to use um, sort of turn that on its head. Because, uh, you know, if we look at some of the most popular, best money, are you still there? Daryl? I think Daryl's gone. So I've got a sign that said he's the host now. His name's still on the screen, so. Shall I continue to talk? Are we being it says, we're, it says we're recording, so you may as well continue. Okay. Um, if we look at some of the most popular media out there, some of the, the greatest money-making media that's in reality television, and... Uh, if we look at some of the most popular reality television, those are the cooking shows, right? And uh, 
how, how does that work? What's what's most important? What are the important pieces of evidence for us as consumers of food? Um, well, that's that's taste, it's appearance, uh, it's the smell, it's the uh, ambiance and the conditions in which we're enjoying the food. Are we there with friends? Or all of these things are important. How many of those attributes do you get when you're watching a, a cooking show? Well, you don't get to taste it, you don't get to smell it, you don't get to be eating it with your friends, you don't get you don't you don't really get any of them. What you get is some proxy evidence by way of the judges that say this tastes good or that looks good and or that's about it. So cooking shows, wildly popular. We all care very much about who wins. And yet those things which we claim to be most important when it comes to cooking, we have very little ability to evaluate. So what, what are we evaluating? Well, we're evaluating the character of those who are participating. Very early on, the first things we get in the introductions to these programs are attributes of these characters. So we can immediately become predictive. Oh, this person's gonna face, gonna face major hardship throughout this show. And I want to see them face that because of this, that, and the other thing. This person, well, they've got to succeed. They, they there's so much, so much riding on their success and they're such a good person. They're good to animals and they love their children. And you know, all of this stuff comes out immediately, the very, very beginning, very beginning of these programs, just like these Mel Gibson and Rocky scene that we were talking about, in order to put you as an audience member. Uh, someone who, in this case, doesn't get to decide whether they win or not, but gets to root for a winner, to put you in a position to begin to predict and begin to feel what you believe it has to be the morally correct outcome. On top of that, they'll continue to layer on these stakes. Uh, if this person wins, the money doesn't mean money to them. It means their ability uh, for their, their child to get the medical treatment that they've needed. And we like this person. And so now are we going, why should that matter? Why we, we now like this person and, and feel for this person and want this person to win because of what winning means, what the stakes are. But does that change how we think about their food? It doesn't really matter. <laughs> the food doesn't matter at this point. Of course it does. Of course it changes how we think about the food. If it changes our, 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 our impressions of the food that we get very little of anyway, other than by sight. Um, but it also changes that of the judges and so on and so forth. It's not the same as a courtroom because we don't have a say in the final outcome. But uh, that's, that's the twist that makes it commercially viable for, for, for the people who make this kind of program. Because we don't actually have a say, we sit there and feel like there should be a particular outcome. There must be a particular right outcome. And we know what that outcome is. And they have our rapt attention until they either give us that outcome or they don't. So we stick around for the commercials. So um, what does the future <laughs> of uh, this collaboration on persuasion look like for you? Is it a book? Are you going to make it into a movie? Are you going to take it on the road? Uh, so it's funny you should ask. That, yeah. So it's funny you should ask that question. So I'll give you uh, an answer that Joe's never heard before. But to you know, stay <laughs> on brand here. As you may recall, what we were talking before we started the podcast, when you said, well, I'm going to ask about leadership. And Joe said, well, you know, Gildan will take the lead on that. You know, we should use the Finding the Trial Story program, take the lead, two leaders, take the non-lawyer leaders through the trial program, and then add one hour saying, okay, now let's apply these precepts to your particular problem, your particular leadership style. I mean, this is... You know, because it's embedded in neuroscience about how people uh, act and react, because lawyers are the last people who understand this. You know, people are doing this in neuromarketing. Medical profession is understanding this. You know, we, if we were really smart, we would probably start just marketing this under the same heading to leaders in some way, uh, because again, it is it it's contrary so many precepts about the rational ideal. So there's a book by Tali Sherrod, a neuroscientist, The Influential Mind, which has still rocked my world. She said, you know, we're, we're trained and probably as leaders as well. I'm going to train your, your mind through logic by giving you data support of the position. And it turns out that if you're offering so many data that's contrary to their existing belief system, their brain will automatically look 
for validation of the original belief. It's a boomerang effect. So the more you press, the more you're actually sending them back into to their existing system. So you have to work to say, well, no, I can't do it that way. I have to start by saying, let me listen and find the common ground. I can't persuade you by saying, I know this isn't what you think, but really I'm the leader X. So if you said the leader has to come in and find out where people are at, uh, and then say, let me work with their existing belief system and try to use that predictive power. You also have to give them agency. Uh, the neuroscientists said, you, 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 can't, you can't say you must decide this way. You have to lead them to that decision, which I think you know, the stakes are doing. And you have to offer them positive incentives more than adverse actions because it's more motivating. So if we take all the findings of neuroscience, we take how the storytellers in the, you know, other visual arts and creative arts have implemented that, you know, it's just sort of, we're working with lawyers now. Yeah, I mean, this we is like, we'd like to continue to work with lawyers, uh, but there's no, re no reason that this wouldn't apply actually. I must say from a personal perspective, I'm now, I'm now pivoting to saying, all right, we've, we've written the articles for lawyers about what you should do. Now, I think we have to challenge the system by saying, here's the assumptions. As you know, Daryl, this is my sabbatical project. Here's the assumptions for our existing trial processes, how the jurors are going to decide. Here's how we know they're actually going to decide. So what, what changes do we need to a, a centuries-old process to make it more justice by being more neurocongruent? By way of example, again, I have, I have no answers, but you know, our, our basic notion General, my God, the opening statement is not evidence. Don't do anything to persuade. Just tell what your evidence will show, but the jurors aren't to be persuaded by it. Maybe you should say, own up to it. Say, listen, they're going to start predicting. And say that, instead of saying to lawyers what you can't do, say, lawyers, here's how you have to open. You have to tell, come up with a one-person story. You have to tell their character, motive, and plot at stakes. You must do this in the opening. Because if we want justice, and this is what they're looking for, I'm forcing you to use the story method and stakes to tell your side. It's just the opposite of what we're thinking now, which is let's make sure it has nothing to do with it. But if that's how it's gonna be, let's say, you know, what's gonna force you to take your best shot at this? Again, it's crazy, but maybe we, you know, this is just to be provocative to say, don't, don't we, now that we know what's happening and now that we've got people who've told us how, how to do it, maybe we need to have our, you can't, there's no way the system stops it from happening. So maybe we need to, rethink the system. So I think that's where I'm at inside the realm of law, but I'm just much more interested in its application outside, including apropos of your wonderful series, a lot of lessons in leadership. You know, you've seen it implicitly. People are talking about servant leadership, purpose-driven leadership, not top-down leadership. All of that is really different ways of saying the same sort of thing we've been dealing with here. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's not... Um... It's not sort of like a new technique of manipulation. I think it's really, and the, the, this is why it does apply. It, 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 it's an understanding that you can't talk someone into or change their mind or, or make them do what you want them to do or decide what you want them to do or follow what you want them to follow. You have to understand what are the pieces of information that they need in order for the natural process of story creation, which takes place in the person who's listening's brain. Now, what, what are those pieces of information and how are they best given to the person so that they create the story that will take them to this just conclusion, right? And it's, 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 a, it's a new understanding of that, I think, rather than uh, looking at, how, yeah, that's it. Yeah, you know, and by the way, when I say leadership, this transcends, you know, entity or corporate leadership. But you're trying to leading a social reform organization. You know, you can't say I've mustered all the medical data that tells you X if that contradicts right. the belief system of the folks you're trying to persuade. You know, right. you're you're there as a climate change advocate. You know, someone's a climate skeptic. You can't say, well, let me show you the data because, especially now in our misinformation society, probably in the in their information bubble, that, didn't information <laughs> bubble, there's probably popped up while I was trying to tell you the data, the counter data. We have to start having a conversation about, you know, thinking about, well, what's the common ground here? 
they uh, start talking about you know what they want for their kids and what they want for their grandkids, what world they want for their kids and their grandkids, and start talking about you know what their fears are and what their hopes are for their grandkids, not my agenda there, and then just listen, listen or the openings where I'm seeing a commonality of a belief system where I can use, let's talk about the story of your kids and your story of your grandchildren and, you know, take it to the, so I think it, you know, as I said, all of the vexing social issues in our increasingly polarized society, where we're making an enormous mistake of saying, I'll just give you more facts and I'll become more, uh, you know, emotional on my side of the equation to make it, to force my thing you know, until you change, you need to change. You know, you need to change. Totally <laughs> ineffective. We're just driving people even <laughs> further right. into the belief system, yeah. as they say, compounded by misinformation, where if you're looking for validation, there's something there on your phone from your little group that's telling you that. So, you know, if we're talking about all the great social challenges uh, that are facing us, again, many of which are existential. So if we're talking about equality, if we're talking about a just society, uh, you know, where people aren't judged on race or ethnicity or religion, uh, we have to use these same precepts again. To me, it's this congruence of the, sto the storytelling really was a recognition of you know, how it is without before we knew it from neuroscience how the brain works and and, and and we're talking about you so much of it, it taps into this pattern matching capability which comes out of this universality of, of human experience our experiences aren't all the same we don't all come from the same place but yet at some level there is a lot of commonality that i uh, and and that's what enables this to work and also proves that point. So that and that's what you taught as the trial story to find, not one that you could come up with, but rather the one that uh character aligns with motive and what you're saying happen aligns with that. And it, it's a universal thing, not I have a like a three three standard deviations off the bell curve person. No matter who the jury is, they're gonna understand this character, they're gonna understand their motive. Right. And when they do that, they've experienced how these people behave. People, you know. People care about their children. They want them to do well in the world. They want them to, you know, there, there, there are these things that are 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 pretty universal. And, and can I say also that it's such a timely uh, resource that you're bringing to all of us as we think about. I think it's scary. Talked about the data, the facts out there. Actually, sometimes false facts too. But the idea that technology is permeating our lives, you are reminding us that at the end of the day, we're humans. And it's that process of speaking from one human to another that's ultimately going to be what makes the persuasion work. Yeah, so thank you for your work over the last plus 10 plus years. Congratulations. Uh, one year late, congratulating you on your 10th anniversary. But I hope there'll be another 10 years. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, where this goes. So proud of this, the fact that uh, Penn State Dickinson Law is the home for this uh, opportunity for our students and hopefully broader legal community and, as Gary was alluding to, broader leadership community as well. Uh, and I can say to folks, well, you heard it here first. So thank you for joining us, Joe. Yeah. Thank you for joining Thanks us, for Gary. Uh, looking forward to the next chapter.